Hello, I'm not Chuck. In the last video I discussed specific gravity in lead-acid batteries like the ones used in RVs and vans adapted for full-time living. I explained what specific gravity is and showed how to measure it using a hydrometer. It's important for properly maintaining your batteries and getting the most from the money that you paid for them. Measuring the specific gravity provides the perfect opportunity for checking the electrolyte level in each cell and adding water if needed. At the last of this video, I'll demonstrate that process and suggest a good tool to use. But the main topic of this video is keeping records of the performance of your batteries over time. And to do that, you need an organized method. I'll show you what I use and how I use it. You're welcome to use my format or to adapt it to suit your preferences. As I write this, I'm trying to find a way to make a PDF available for you to download. Check the video description below for a link. I'll put it there as soon as possible. Please excuse the poor audio quality of this clip. This is a chart that I created in order to have a place to record the measured specific gravity for each of the six cells in my two batteries that I use in my travel trailer. This chart is for battery A. This chart is for battery B. We'll actually only be completing the chart for battery A today in order not to make the video any longer than necessary. We want to record today's date which is March 23rd, 2018. You'll have to pardon my handwriting. I know it's terrible. The next thing we want to put in our uh, record chart is the electrolyte temperature. And we're going to put that in as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I didn't measure the electrolyte temperature. What I did was measure the ambient temperature, that is the temperature of the air that surrounds the batteries that are on the travel trailer. And because the batteries have been neither charged nor loaded in any way in the last 48 hours, I can be fairly certain that the temperature of the electrolyte is the same as the temperature of the air around the batteries, which is 50 degrees. Now, we measured a specific gravity in cell number 1 of 1.280. But because specific gravity is supposed to be measured at a temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and we measured it at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, we have to make a temperature correction. The way we do that is sub to subtract 50 degrees Fahrenheit from 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and we get a difference of 30 degrees. We know that the rule says that we have to make a correction of 0 .004 for every 10 degrees of difference between the standard and the actual temperature. Now in this case, we divide the 30 degrees by 10, the answer is 3. There are 3 10 degree segments in 30 degrees. And then we multiply 3 times that correction factor of 0 .004 and we get a result of 0 .012. So there's our temperature correction. Because the actual temperature was less than the standard temperature, we want to subtract 0 .012 from 1.280 and the answer is 1.268. You probably didn't absorb all the details of making temperature corrections to specific gravity readings and if you didn't that's fine you can pause the video and read the information on the screen to completely understand how to make the corrections. The next step is to convert this corrected specific gravity figure of 1.268 into a calculated voltage for cell number one. To do that, we'll be using a chart. A chart that you've probably seen before. This is the state of charge table from the data sheet for the 30XHS battery made by Trojan Battery Company. What we're looking for in the specific gravity column is a reading of 1.268. Well, 
There are lots of numbers there, but none of them are 1.268. However, we see that 1.268 is between 1.258 and 1.277. In fact, it's almost halfway in between. If it were exactly 1.258, then we'd know that our cell voltage is 2.103. If it were exactly 1.277, we'd know that our cell voltage was 2.122. Since it's halfway in between 1.258 and 1.277, we can safely assume that the cell voltage is about halfway in between 2.103 and 2.122. That turns out to be 2.112. So now we'll put our calculated voltage as 2.112. 2 decimal 112. If we had a different measured specific gravity reading for each of the six cells, and we should, we would put each of those readings in the appropriate box, we'd go through the same arithmetic, and we'd consult the table every time we got an answer and put down the calculated voltage here. Since we're assuming that all the cells measure 1.280, then the calculated voltage will be the same for all six cells. We know that a 12 volt battery consists of six cells. Those six cells are connected in series. And whenever we have batteries connected in series, the voltage adds. So if we add the voltage in cell number one, plus number two, plus number three, plus number four, five, and six, add all six of those together, we will get the voltage of the entire battery. That happens to be 12.672. You may recall that I measured the voltage of battery A. I measured it twice, in fact, and both times I got approximately 12.60 volts. So we'll put that measured voltage in that block. Now one would hope and expect that the measured voltage and the calculated voltage would be the same. But as you can see, they are not. However, there are some reasons for that. One is because we didn't measure our specific gravity very accurately. It's hard to measure accurately using the electrolyte level in a hydrometer. It's just hard to get right on the numbers. Also, our temperature correction may not be precise. In addition, we're using a chart and we had to interpolate between two rows in the chart to get this reading. However, we still came fairly close. Close enough that in this case it really doesn't matter. Our whole objective in keeping this chart is not to make these two numbers agree. It's not even to find out what the total voltage of the battery is. Our objective is to keep a record of what the individual specific gravity readings were and what the calculated voltages were and in a month or perhaps two months when we check the battery again be able to compare those numbers to these numbers and see how our battery is holding up. If we see little or no change in the numbers then we know our battery is holding up well. If we see a significant change from these numbers to numbers a couple of months later, we know that we must be doing something wrong, or at least something is going wrong, either with the way the batteries are built or the way we're treating the batteries. In all honesty, the most likely cause of battery failure is the batteries are mistreated by their owners, either by overcharging the batteries, undercharging the batteries, or excessively discharging the batteries. I'll talk more about that later. I'm using a flashlight to look inside each cell and check the electrolyte level.
it's not always easy to tell exactly where the level is supposed to be. So the first thing I do is to check and see if the level of one cell is significantly different from the others. Most batteries have a marking or some other indicator inside the cell to show where the electrolyte is supposed to be, but the indicator differs from one brand of battery to another. Check the data sheet for your battery. If you find that one or more cells need more electrolyte, you should add distilled water. Tap water may contain dissolved metals or other material that will contribute to early cell failures. Distilled water is only a dollar or so per gallon, and a gallon goes a very long way. A battery filler is important to have and to use exclusively for water. This one works well for me, but there are probably others just as good or maybe better. Try not to let the tip of the nozzle touch the electrolyte as you're adding water. And be careful not to add too much water. Removing it is tricky and will reduce the concentration of acid in the electrolyte. You may see videos that advise you to add acid to your batteries, but you do so at your own peril. Most battery manufacturers recommend never adding acid, and I agree that it's a risky thing for most people to try. It's also important to check the specific gravity of the electrolyte before adding any water to the cell. Otherwise, your hydrometer will pick up too much water off the top and result in low specific gravity readings. That's all for this video. Next time I will finally do the pros and cons of the three main types of lead acid batteries. Flooded, AGM, and gel. It's one you won't want to miss. By the way, I'm still struggling to add subscribers. Please like and share this video, and most of all, please subscribe. Thanks, and don't forget, I'm not Chuck.